Good. Good to know. Um, and it is wonderful to be having these conversations at the beautiful University of Sydney, Australia's oldest university, built in the Victorian Gothic style, borrowed from another time and another place on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, on lands that were never ceded and with a long history of student activism, including Charles Perkins' Freedom Ride in 1965, where he and other students shone a light onto racial discrimination, and more recent partnerships between students and staff around critical issues of our time, such as climate action and freedom of expression. So for those in the room who don't know, and those online, um, SVA was born out of Professor Sally Varnum's National Senior Teaching Fellowship at UTS, which she developed a new national framework for student partnership in decision-making and governance that is underpinned by principles of authenticity, transparency, support, inclusion, recognition, and sustainability. And SVA has grown into a network of 25 institutions who continue this conversation. And we support students and staff working together to ensure that students can shape our policies and our practices of our institutions. We are lucky enough to have Sally in the room with us today and also Kate Walsh. Um, and this collaboration um, brought together the pilot of SVA in 2019. Their work in this space and ours too is ongoing and it stood on the shoulders of work that had been done for decades at institutions to support student voice. And I want to thank all of our members for their work to enhance our network every day and every year. There's some important work going on right now in our network to make sure that what we do uh, fits the needs um, of our institutions today. So today at the 2024 symposium, symposium at this particular moment in history, we have another unique opportunity to learn, to connect and to listen to each other and to continue those meaningful conversations that enable us to keep students' voices at the centre of our institutions. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Creole Wihongi to provide a reflection on yesterday's Student Summit. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all well. I'm really excited to speak about the day that we had yesterday. So we had our SBA Student Summit and it was a full room. Uh, we had students from across Australia traveling really long hours just to be here. And it was so worth it after seeing the discussions that they were engaging with um, and also learning the feedback from them. We were lucky enough to hear um, a wonderful keynote speech on student leadership. We also had a well-being training session on how to build emotional intelligence and resilience. The other half of the day was connecting with each other. So we did that through a networking session, a student panel on inclusivity, and we also had a roundtable discussion led by eight passionate students. After each session, students reflected on what they learned, and they also provided feedback on actions to build representation and leadership skills, and also to improve collaboration with practitioners and institutions. So this is one of the examples of something that we did um, throughout the day to gather student feedback. We found there to be a strong emphasis on recognizing diverse, underrepresented student groups, such as international LGBTQIA, mature aged and First Nation students, um, highlighting that student leadership must promote inclusion. We had a few key actions. So for students, we found the importance of enhancing leadership development through opportunities. Uh, this could be engaging in committee work and short-term goals to transform aspirations into actionable opportunities. We found number two, a creating a supportive university environment. So introducing a scheduling and calendar course for new leaders to help them balance their academic, personal and leadership responsibilities and prioritizing student well-being. 
Uh, and this could look like facilitating more conversations around spreading leadership responsibilities and working collaboratively to avoid burnout. For institutions and practitioners, we also noted one, facilitating student staff collaboration. So paying students for contributions in course co-design or recognizing these volunteer efforts on transcripts. Closing the feedback loop by ensuring academic accountability and potentially formalizing mid-semester surveys. For supporting underrepresented groups, we found providing targeted resources such as wellbeing support and mentoring to ensure more inclusivity and support um, also making this a standardized approach across universities uh, and doing more university research to understand the issues that these students currently face. And finally, promoting transparency. And this could look like streamlining current resources to provide simplified versions of policy that students can better relate to and regularly communicating the impact of this feedback on university policy decisions. We're really excited to work with such amazing students. A few of them are in the room today, so please um, take the time to get to know them. And I also really look forward to learning from each of you today. I'll now pass it on to Pro Vice Chancellor of Student Life, Susanna Scarparo. Well, thank you. It almost feels like a dream. Um... Um, realizing in front of, my, of me. So I've come to Sydney Uni five years ago with just one mission, embed student voice and co-design in everything we do. So it is my very, very great pleasure to welcome you today to this obviously beautiful campus. And also, yes, Jackie, thank you for reminding us. This is a campus that is built on land that was never ceded, the land of the Gadigal people. I overlaying this European um, uh, print on a place that has always been a place of uh, learning and deep listening. And I think that in the spirit of that today, I wanna welcome you to this, um, the 2024 symposium to do exactly that, to, um, to listen and deeply listen. This is something that I think uh, perhaps we are not so good at these days and to learn from each other and to sit sometimes with very uncomfortable conversations. <clears throat> and I just hope that that is exactly what you will come up with today, at the end of today and at the end of yesterday. So I was so excited just to come in for the very first beginning of the student symposium. I didn't want to impose, but it was just so wonderful to see so many students from everywhere um, engaged in that conversation. So, but firstly, I would like to thank the teams responsible for planning and delivering such an important event. The significant work of Anna Kuleshova, a wonderful SVA uh, coordinator. So thank you, Anna. I can't quite see you now. <laughs> yes, there you go. I also really want to thank my amazing team. I have to say that my student life team is always willing to do whatever I ask them to do, even the most impossible tasks. So thank you so much to Trish and Harley. If you want to stand up, please. Um, they have worked tirelessly um, for the probably past six months uh, organizing this event and trying to, to think through of how we, uh, how we could be host um, with uh, generosity or spirit and very much open to learning from each other. Now, you probably are very um, familiar with this. Everyone, everyone now talks about the student voice in educational settings. Everyone professes to want to listen, but how do we really do it? Is there enough to listen and then to acknowledge and then to hide behind the fact that institutions are such large bureaucracies? So the first task really is to try to, um, to understand how the, the student voice can be embedded in everything the university does, including the governance, the policy settings. And that is a challenge. It's a challenge that at this institution we have taken up. And so I'm very pleased to say that we have a number of, uh, in a sense, student liaison, um, student leaders 
they are hired, they are paid for the contribution, and they are um, crucial in a they contribute to liaison committees and they are very crucial in decisions that we make and uh, programs that we deliver and also many other things and the approach that we take, you know, to how we do it. I'm also very proud of the partnership that we have developed um, with our student organizations, particularly the USU, and I acknowledge Sam and Jess today for being here. It's not always an easy relationship between an institution and an independent student organization. And I acknowledge that that sometimes can be uncomfortable, but that is the work that we need to do. So thank you for sometimes listening to my very um, direct feedback. <laughs> and I'm also happy to receive direct feedback, obviously. I'm Italian after all, so I can take it. Um, I don't want to uh, take too much of your time here today, but I just really want to, um, to focus on the word partnership and to really tease out the meaning of that word. Partnership means sometimes being humble and sometimes means that you're gonna have to do things that you might not wanna do. And I think that if I can um, interpret the spirit of SVA, particularly from, the, from its you know, original settings, probably that is what universities need to do and embed the student voice in in what we do, but also celebrate that voice, celebrate and reward that voice. And I think that it is important for people such as myself, those of us who, by the way, we have no power because <laughs> no one really has power, but we occupy certain roles where we can certainly um, try to influence decision-making. So one of the things that, for instance, in the University of Sydney, we push for is that we pay our student leaders, and that we also want to develop a strong uh, foundational student leadership program to support the work that they do uh, while they are here and also when they go off in their lives. And so with these words, um, I would just like to leave you with a few things. So I just hope that today is a day where we all leave with more questions than when we came with that we live thinking through the issues, that no one has the easy answers, but everyone is prepared to do some work. And that perhaps we live, um, that at the end of the day, we feel that we become friends and that we, we can rely on each other and we learn from each other what works, what doesn't work, what we need to do better. Because there is always, and my team knows, continuous improvement. <laughs> Anyway, I think that the very first step in doing so is to listen from a keynote speaker today. So I'm really, really um, very pleased and uh, very excited um, to introduce you to Professor Ryan Naylor. Uh, Ryan is an academic coordinator in education quality and also professor of higher education at the Sydney School of Health Sciences at the University of Sydney. He's also a Fulbright scholar He's a principal fellow of the Higher Education Academy, and he's also a member of the Student Success Journal's editorial board. Ryan's current research focuses primarily on understanding and addressing barriers to success in higher education. He has published widely on issues of access to higher education, equity programs, and the evaluation of such programs, and the experiences and expectations of students. So, you could say that he knows a few things, right, about what we are here to discuss today. So thank you so much, Ryan, and please join me, Ryan, to the stage. Well, thank you, Susanna, for that very kind, possibly over-generous introduction. Um, thank you to Anna for inviting me to speak to you all today. Thank you for your attention, um, and thank you for the organisers who have brought us all together. I'd also... Uh, so uh, my talk today is going to be about the transformational potential of student voices. Reciprocity, respect, barriers and provocations is one of those academic talk titles that has far too much going on in it. Um, but the, the important bit is the first part about the transformational potential of student voice. Uh, and probably the other important part is the provocations bit. So the, po the purpose of a keynote is to give you something to talk about over morning tea. Uh, even if what you're talking about is how bad my talk was, 
So as long as you're doing that, I will consider myself a success. So before we go on, um, I'd like to acknowledge again that we are meeting on the unceded land of the Gadigal people and pay my respects to elders who have cared and continue to care for country and all of the First Nations people here today. So who am I? Um, my picture hasn't come out properly, but anyway, uh, I'm a, a, a researcher in higher education. I'm particularly interested in barriers to success in higher education. So for me, that's particularly looking at things from a student equity widening participation lens. If you had to make me identify with a discipline that's not higher education, I'd probably tell you I was a social psychologist. So that means I'm interested in the ways that individuals uh, interface with the structure, structure. social structures around them. So those social structures are made up of, of other individuals, of course, interactions with other people. Um, and the technologies and processes and things they create. So it's not monolithic. It's about the, the relationships between people and the things that people have made. Uh, and that's true for the university. It's true for society as a whole. So when we talk about engagement, for example, it's not about what the student does. It's not about what the university does, but about what they do together in that interface. Um, so for the purposes of my talk today, um, what that means is that I'm looking at the role of the student voice in transforming social structures. That's the theme of my talk. The student voice is an agent of transformation of social structures. Now, obviously there's a wide range of different models of participation. And if you think back to that slide that Creole just showed us, um, I think you'll see that the, the students are telling us in that word cloud that they are experiencing different aspects of this uh, spectrum. Now, I've chosen to use the word models of participation um, because participation is a relatively neutral term, uh, but you can see it encompasses everything from a consultative point of view, so where students are consulted, but other people put into action um, or not what they've been told. So that's a model that has very low agency for the students who are participating in that. But that goes through things like um, a collaborative, model, a partnership model, and through into an empowerment model where there's a very strong sense of agency given to students. Um, now, obviously there are multiple layers and context to all of this. Um, and some areas of the spectrum may be more valuable than others. I'm not saying that these are all equal ways to interact with students, but the important thing is that the student voice is present through all of it. So just to give you a couple of examples, um, the stu student, uh, student evaluations of teaching surveys are a very clear example of that consultative model. Then we have things like the traditional governance where you have student uh, representatives sitting on university committees and things as a collaborative model. So here, you know, students are listened to, they're in the room, they're part of the group, um, but they're often not an equal member. You know, they're auxiliary members, they're additional members. There's still that power disparity between um, you know, the student members and the real members, if you'll forgive the expression. I certainly don't mean it, uh, except ironically. Beyond that, there's the, you know, the traditional co-design uh, partnership models. And then beyond that, there's empowerment. So I've, I've just put this reference up here, um, just as a really interesting paper that I've read fairly recently, where the, the sense of empowerment that the students had comes through really clearly in this paper. Uh, through their participation in this project. So I'd like you to talk about co-design and partnership and that sort of thing, but I'd like you to think about examples of empowerment beyond that co-design partnership model. And this is a really good example of um, such a case. So if all of these different uh, types of participation interact with the student voice, what does the student voice tell us actually matters most? And I can paraphrase this question quite easily. What did we learn from COVID? And what we learned from COVID is that relational teaching matters. So that's what's important in, um, in education, what's important in participation. And again, we can answer this fairly easy because Mercer Mapstone and colleagues did a, a large review of the literature uh, back in 2020, 2017 and found almost exactly the same thing. So. In terms of what matters most in uh, you know, co-design and participation, they found that the key drivers for success were reciprocity and mutual respect. So these same principles 
are important, whether we're talking about kind of working with students interactively, uh, co-curricularly, or within the curriculum itself. Now, <laughs> once again, the graphics are not supporting me, but that, that should be over the us, if that's not clear. This is one of those things where you should always check on the computer you're going to be using on the day. Um, so the point I was going to make on this slide is that when I'm saying, what does the student voice tell us? Who is the us that we're talking about? And when I'm talking about us, I mean everyone. I'm including students in this. I'm using a very inclusive sense of the we in this. Because uh, I've, I've worked with student co-design teams and um, in participatory empowerment teams and so on over a number of years. And the, uh, the common theme that I hear from the students is that hearing the student voice is really important to them as well. You know, not only do they get that sense of empowerment by um, hearing others and communicating with others and being listened to, but they also get the learning experience of understanding that not everyone thinks about things the same way or experiences the world in the same way as them. So it's a really valuable learning experience, that broadening of perceptions that is such an important part of higher education. So throughout this talk, I'm using us inclusively. Now, if that's about all the importance of relationality, what's the alternative? And the alternative is transactionality. And again, from the future, we know there's an enormous amount of uh, potential for uh, negative outcomes, for risk, through very transactional attitudes between um, you know, students and the university or within the university. So some of these attitudes include things like P's get degrees, uh, fees get degrees. So because I pay my student fees, I should be entitled to the qualification. Low student motivation, poor learning outcomes, low teacher morale, um, and ultimately kind of a loss or the undermining of the, the social license of higher education as a sector. So if these are the two poles, my first provocation is this. How do your work practices embed reciprocity and mutual respect for all parties? Now, I'm sure for all the people here today, um, you know, it's very easy. I'm sure that everyone here is very confident that the work that you are doing uh, for the students and staff involved in the project strongly embed these principles. So the bit where I would like to challenge you is to think further than just that, that, that immediate situation. How do your work practices embed reciprocity and mutual respect for the communities that students and staff come from and belong to? What about reciprocity and mutual respect for staff members who are more time poor or less willing or have, shall we say, less enlightened attitudes towards participation and empowerment? What about university leadership? Now, I think we'll probably all agree that it's very easy to, to respect those people kind of earlier in that list that I gave you, but it's maybe less natural to think about it at the, the later ends, um, unless, of course, you have exceptional university leadership and those sort of things. That, that leadership does make a difference in this. Uh, and, of course, re respect doesn't necessarily mean agreement. I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to suggest that everyone needs to agree with the positions of all these people, merely that they are respected. And for the students in the room, how does your work demonstrate this? Again, I'm using us inclusive, inclusively. Okay, so I'm going to present a couple of case studies. The, the main case study I want to talk about is students as agents in their own success. And to do this, we need to talk about what is success in higher education. And like a lot of the terms we use in higher education, like engagement, belonging, it is fuzzy, it's complex, it's multi-layered, it's complex at multiple levels. And uh, if we look at it, the, you know, what counts as success differs from different perspectives. So we can talk about it from the point of view of society, you know, is a successful higher education system one that is creating a, more, a better informed, a freer, a, a more cohesive society? But it's a very different understanding of success to one, you know, purported by employers and whether students are, uh, or whether graduates are work ready and lifelong learners and all of those. Oh. Sort of. 
And again, that's slightly different view of most universities. And then within the universities, each discipline will probably have a slightly different understanding of what a successful education in chemistry or in mathematics or in the arts or, you know, in the preparation of health workers. And then, of course, students themselves have, you know, very individualized, diverse, complex understandings of what success means for them. So, so what counts as success and who gets to decide it? Now, I think most of the people here are practitioners. So I think I would guess that if I asked you how the university defines success for you in your role, it's probably about something like meeting KPIs. Is that true? Anyone want to disagree? Yep. Um, but if I asked you what counts as success for you individually and personally, I would say that KPIs would come quite a long way down the list. Is that also the case? Yep. Right. Okay. So a couple of years ago, I went to the US. Uh, I was at Kansas State University, and I asked these questions to a group of students. So K-State is large for US universities, kind of small to moderate for Australian university. Um, and I sat down with a group of first year kind of transition education classes called a CAT community. So it's a group of about 40 students. They're from predominantly uh, white school leaver rural backgrounds. I asked them, how do you think K-State defines success at university? And they said, graduation, getting a job. So as part of this project, um, I also did with my colleague, Melanie Keep a uh, scoping review of the literature and found that, you know, the students aren't wrong. You can see that uh, as part of the review, we identified um, just under 1,500 papers in total, and then we excluded 1,400 of those because they were based on kind of researcher-led definitions of success, not student-led definitions of success. But what was really clear in those 1,400 papers is that the way they define success was graduation, GPA, getting a job. So even though they were first year, in fact, first semester students, the students had picked up this message really clearly that that is what the university cared about. That's what mattered to them. Um, and, you know, the data that we collect, the type of research, the questions that we ask tells us and tells the people that we work with what's important or what we think is important. We rarely ask what matters to each other as individuals. Just as another example, you know, we, we don't collect a lot of um, systematic mental health information, even though I'm sure that if we went around and asked about it today, we talk about well-being and maintaining well-being through your studies as a really important part of success. So what we measure matters and people pick that up. Now, of course, if you ask students what counts as success, it is far more complex. Far more individual. Now, I'm not expecting you to read all of this, obviously, but the only impression I want to give is just how diverse and wide ranging student conceptions of success are. Um, but they're not, there's not infinite variation in this either. You know, they can cluster around 12 big themes. But what's also important is that within these 12 themes, none of the papers we looked at actually touched on all 12 of those themes. So the research, even the ones that's engaging with students and the student voice, still has a kind of a narrower view than all of the options that are available if you look at the literature as a whole. And what was also interesting is the way that uh, these research questions were problematized. So people started asking these questions because they were interested in what equity students or non-traditional students had to say because there was the assumption that because they were non-traditional students, they would have non-traditional mechanisms of success. And, you know, the converse of that is that therefore traditional students care about GPA, graduations, getting a job. And that is absolutely not the case. So when you look at the literature, uh, it is true that students from these non-traditional backgrounds are much more likely to want to give back to their local communities. Uh, that kind of agent of transformation in your community is really important to students from these backgrounds, but that's really the only difference. You know, there's much more variation between individuals, regardless of their groups, than there is between the groups as a whole. So that's the only difference that we can see based on um, 
background in terms of all of the diverse ways that students understand success. But again, after six months, oops, too far? Um, <laughs> lucky this isn't being recorded. Um, but after six months, again, those first year students at K-State had picked up this narrow, impoverished view of what success meant to the university. So how can we create a sector that recognizes and values this diversity of success? And the question here really is, what's the product of higher education and what's the byproduct of higher education? What are we trying to achieve? What do we care about? What matters? And what is just kind of a happy coincidence that arises out of that? And I'm going to argue that we need more in that product of education, our understanding of that, and less in, as a byproduct. But again, this is provocation, so I'll leave it up for you to discuss over morning tea. But, you know, the, the risk that I'm trying to highlight is that students will adapt to this impoverished view of what success means. If we tell them that, or if they get pick up the idea that that is what we value, then they will grow to fix the box they're placed in. I think this was a perfect image and I was delighted when I found it. Um, and this links back to that transactional attitude in education, you know, all of those negative side effects we talked about before. Uh, because, um, you know, if we take out those relationships, that individuality, if we tell them the GPA is the only thing that matters, then it leads to a situation where students will, you know, strategically try to maximize their GPAs for very good reasons. Okay, so this is an education talk in 2024, so I have to talk about AI, it's contractually required. Um, AI is both the elephant in the room and the storm on the horizon. But to lead into this, I'm going to talk about a different study that uh, Tracy Bretag and colleagues did in 2019, where they uh, did a survey of a, like, a huge number of student participants. And um, they asked them whether they uh, had cheated on assessment tasks in the past and what their attitudes were to a variety of different things around academic um, honesty and misconduct and that sort of thing. So what they found is that students admitted to cheating on important high stakes tasks, uh, but also on all kinds of trivial things as well. Also, the attitudes about what's right and wrong um, didn't vary that much between the students who admitted to cheating and those who didn't. So sometimes listening to the student voice uh, tells us unpleasant truths about the world. But what was important is that, um, or what, what the point I want to emphasize is that there is a risk that things like generative AI uh, exacerbates these transactional attitudes. Because as I said, it is strategic if GPA is the only thing that matters to maximize your GPA. Now, when I was in teacher education, I had a quote that I like to use, which was that the point of lecturing is for the notes of the lecturer to become the notes of the student without passing through the brains of either. Uh, now, with AI, of course, we no longer even need those notes. The, the brains might have been completely removed from the situation. But if we think back to those, uh, well, to the slide that I told you not to read, very clearly on that is that many students want to think, they want to learn to think, uh, they want to expand their minds. I've been doing some work here at Sydney with some students about attitudes to AI and so on. And this comes through really strongly. Students that I spoke to are actually quite conservative about the use of AI because they felt like it was cheating. And what they wanted to, when they came to university was to learn. And AI felt like it was a cheat to do that. So, I think you know for, for most of us, students and staff, that learning is at the is at the core of education. So it's really important to remember that. But if we do AI badly, there is the risk that we will entrench transactionality in that these relationships. So, you know, grades have been used in the past to motivate students. It's not just about uh, how well you've learned and how you've demonstrated your learning. Like late penalties is a really clear example of this. It's got nothing to do with what you've learned. It's all about motivating student behavior so that you'll hand your assignments in on time. And beyond the university, there's all of these other attitudes towards grades. So, you know, you don't want to waste your ATAR by applying for a course that's, you know, you could easily get in. You want to do something that you don't want to do 
but it's more exclusive. Grades are really strongly within the locus of control of universities. So if there are these kind of challenging attitudes towards things like grades in the university and beyond it, and it's something that we can control so easily, how are we going to grapple with something that is so much bigger, so much uh, more out of our control with something like AI? So my second, the third provocation is how can we use AI to support empowerment models of learning? Or alternatively, how can AI support empowerment models of participation? Because all of the examples I've given are about learning, but university life is so much more than just that. At the end of all the process of curriculum reform and so on, what sort of relationships will be embedded? If you go back to that educational interface, um, that interaction between individuals and the university, will we have structures that empower or remove agency? Will we embed relational teaching, relationships in the university, or will we embed a transactional approach? Okay. So for the last part of my talk, I'm gonna talk about students as agents of transformation in the future of education. So this is the, the student voice looking out more broadly into what higher education could be in the future. And I've got five quick provocations about this. So the first is the university's accord. Now, the process uh, to this point has been a very consultative model, consultative both for students and for the higher education sector as a whole. But how will the student voice be captured in the implementation phase of the accord? Once the implementation is over, how will the student voice be embedded in the Australian Tertiary Education Committee? A commission, sorry. Now, Provocation five is around the international student voice. So these are some headlines from a couple of days ago, uh, just a quick Google search. And with the possible exception of that top one, the others have a very clear theme around international students as cash cows, visa concerns, soft targets, problems. And this is a clear example of a kind of, you know, a broader social positioning of international students as, as a transactional uh, component to the university. And again, you know, th this is a complex situation. So international students have cultural differences, obviously, um, different financial prior priorities to domestic students, and that may encourage uh, an initially more of a transactional approach. That's, that is a risk. But the question that I am asking here is how the international student voice is heard, because it's clearly not being heard as equal partners and participants in these headlines. Who, the question that underlies these and the way that we listen to international students is who belongs as a legitimate member and who is a peripheral member of our university communities? Similarly, First Nations voices. Now we've heard, I think already twice so far this morning, and we've only been going for less than an hour about how this is a, a European structure planted in Gadigal land. And it is very clear that, you know, universities are heirs to the uh, historical, social, cultural uh, context of European colonial colonialism in Australia. So my question is, are universities inherently paternalistic colonial entities. Because if you think back to my spectrum at the start, um, when we talk about less agency or more agency in the way that we interact with students, we could paraphrase that to say some ways are more paternalistic or less paternalistic than others. Now, I don't think that we are inherently um, colonial paternalistic entities, but I do think it's gonna be a challenge to shift the culture from where we are now to, um, to meet the challenge of decolonization of our institutions. Now, one of the, the main ways that we're talking about doing that is through indigenization of the curriculum. And there are different ways, different approaches to that. So the first, and I'd say probably the most basic is around content. So teaching knowledge about First Nations people. Um, and 
an issue with that is that it, you know, it literally objectifies First Nations people and knowledges as something to learn about, something other, something different. The step up from that is more a kind of a cognitive approach. Uh, so not just knowledge about First Nations people, but knowledge from First Nations people. And uh, again, not to name any institutions that I might happen to work at and have seen where this sort of happens, is that there is a risk here that this becomes tokenistic. So you have, for example, um, here is a charming anecdote about what Aboriginal people thought about fermentation and chemistry. So again, it's about othering this experience and expertise, presenting that information as, a, as an anecdote or a curio to spark some interest in a class rather than genuinely engaging. So the third level of decolonization, indigenization of the curriculum is around metacognition. So this is around First Nations ways of knowing. Now, uh, this second um, reference just here, which I've read quite recently, talks about how relationality is at the core of Aboriginal culture. That is, you know, one of the fundamental principles in First Nations cultures. So if I, I posit that if we had that, if we had that as an Indigenous way of knowing that had been incorporated far more deeply and fundamentally into universities, and I wouldn't even be giving this talk. We wouldn't have to talk about transactional versus relational because that would have been part of the way we do business from the beginning. So this is about recognizing not just the knowledge, but the wisdom of First Nations ways of knowing and giving it fair recognition and credit. And we are still a long way away from this. And this will be a huge challenge for universities into the future. Okay, provocation number seven. What actually is the purpose while we're talking about this of higher education? If we are a service industry, who do we serve? Um, and so, you know, we have potentially different masters or different ways of thinking about this, about the economy versus the society, versus uh, private and public benefits, private and public funding. And there are no simple answers to these questions. But what I would like is that the, the student voice is seen as an agent of transformation in the way that these questions are answered. And finally, how do we... Uh, overcome the barriers to genuine empowerment and genuine participation. Now, at the very basic level, there are the, the fundamental dynamics of partnership, you know, just the, the dynamics of individual to individual or individual to group work. And I'm sure these are the, the challenges that you all see on a daily basis. But all of the other things, I warned you at the start, I was very interested to barriers success in higher education. All of the other things I've been talking about are barriers that um, can interpose in and around that as well. So we've talked about power structures, paternalism, the infantilization of students and the minimization of their voice and attitudes, fee structures, uh, the acknowledgement that student is a complex role. You know, sometimes students are legitimately customers of the university, although it pains me to say it. Other times they are learners, other times they are agents, other times they are something else indeed. So uh, the student is so complex, it creates different, uh, different problems in what hat is the student wearing at that point. We've talked about social norms, uh, perceptions, expectations, regulations, policy. Um, and then beyond that, there's the role of universities, the role of students, the role of, you know, all of the different societal and cultural attitudes. Uh, the role of higher education and the social license. There are no simple answers, again, to any of these questions, but I hope that um, I'm very excited to hear some of the case studies we have coming up today who will start to provide answers to at least some of these questions. And if I can finish with a quote from JFK in 1962, talking about going uh, why the US was engaged in the moon missions, we do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because they are important, because they are meaningful. So my call to action to you today, and hopefully next week, as you go back to your jobs and those sorts of things, is to think about ways in which you can, uh, to, to redefine the interaction between students and educational institutions 
to envision a future where education is collaborative, inclusive, and transformative. Here are some references. Um, I think the slides and recording will be available later if you'd like to look up any of the things I talked about. But otherwise, thank you very much for your attention. I believe we've got about 10 minutes. For, we've got more than 10 minutes for questions. How you spoke about um, moving into from what was it into meta the uh, cognitive metacognitive yeah yep do you have you also looked into ways that universities can do that like how they can start that process and everything mm. to doing it um so the question just in case you know for for online um is ways in which we can move through that uh, indigenization of curriculum, um, those models. So I will say this is not necessarily my area. Um, it's something I'm interested in, but I'm absolutely not an expert. And of course, the, the best ways to do this is by listening to Aboriginal communities and Aboriginal students and learning from, you know, we need to approach these conversations with uh, humility, with the um, intent to to learn and to understand and to understand that there are some things that we you know we can't know you know like secret business is an important part of this um but i think the main point of view from uh kind of an educational development side of things is around it is making the shift to do it as a metacognitive understanding to talk about ways of knowing not about content that is that's a shift that we need to understand um so i think if we can make that first step ourselves and then engage uh genuinely and fully as much as possible then that's a good roadmap to begin but as i say i'm not an expert i don't claim to be an expert and i hope that um if i'm wrong someone can challenge me and show us a better way Kirsty? Thank you. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for your talk. Thanks. Uh, Type Setter from Western Sydney Uni. Um, Ryan, I reckon, I wonder if you could have a crack at thinking about what success and student partnership looks like, because I think it's one of the things we avoid sort of really putting our minds to because we sort of frame it as an ethos rather than an outcome. So we're mm. lumbered with all these discourses about what partnership is and in, in the work that we're doing at Western Sydney trying to think about this question of success quite seriously because one of the things that happens is a sort of gratitude that students are at the table and that's where it starts and that's where it ends. I wonder in, in the work that you're doing around success more broadly could you have a crack at trying to think about what success looks like in the student partnership domain to try and expand and go into some of those areas around it that we might be a bit fearful of going into because of, you know, the boogie of neoliberalism and capitalism and those like, big discourses around this work. Yeah, look, I'll have a crack. Great. Uh, <laughs> That's all I ask. <laughs> so I think my, this is not a weasel word, but it, it's important that there is space for different understandings of success in student participation. So what the students are getting out of it is not necessarily what the institution is getting out of it. And so I think a, a full understanding of success in student participation will encompass both of those and, you know, probably more perspectives as well. So from an institutional point of view, um, I think success probably looks like uh, cultural change. It includes things like a sense of belonging, a sense of agility, a sense of responsiveness, so that um, the, the organization that is created through all of those individual interactions and so on is one where 
um, as much as possible, kind of independent of background, students feel they belong, they feel heard, they feel empowered to succeed, um, and they feel respected. Now, for, from a student point of view, there's lots of things that they get out of participation. Um, you know, we, we know that already. So success from kind of that individual point of view might be everything from personal growth to future opportunities to building your CV. Um, and, you know, those are important and legitimate reasons why students participate in these programs. Um, you know, it's kind of... Uh, and it, I don't want to diminish what students get out of these because obviously for a lot of us, what students get out of it is a really important motivator for why we do these jobs. Um, but beyond that, there's also, you know, there's so much more than just what the students benefit from, from an individual point of view. So I think a really important piece of success for students is also that they are able to empower others. They're able to contribute and give back. So, I, it, you know, it's a bit rough and off the cuff, but I think that there are those three large categories um, and to be successful, to talk about success in participation, we need to talk about all three of those kind of in turn and together. So it's what students are doing as individual, what students are getting out of it as individuals and whether it's meeting those needs and motivations and expectations, whether students are being given the opportunity to uh, lead others and contribute and whether the work that we are all doing students and staff together is creating that culture of respect and empowerment for all of the people involved how's that as a rough go thank you <laughs> yeah. hey ryan i'm rohan from deakin university i really like the part where you talked about ai and you talked about, about a lot of negatives and I was just um, wondering if as an educator, do you think there's a, any upside to generative AI as well and um, the role that it plays in education and learning? Yeah, sure. Okay, so the the negative stance is probably because I was trying to be provocative. Um, I will actually say, I think Gen AI is one of the most exciting things that has happened in the last you know, 15 years that I've been an academic. Um, and the opportunity to to rework and rethink about you know what university is for and how we do it and how we measure it and all of those sorts of things, I think it's been incredible uh, challenge and an exciting opportunity for us to do more. So if I was overly negative, that's not actually how I actually uh, how I think about this. Um, but you know, I don't want to in my excitement. I don't want to gloss over the fact that there are challenges around AI in terms of equity of access, in terms of equity of mastery, and kind of the, the equity focus of the outcomes as well, because, you know, these are trained on biased things. And if we're not careful, it'll embed, uh, you know, attitudes and, uh, you know, values that we don't necessarily want to, um, embedded. So absolutely, yes, it is a phenomenal technology and we university in 10 years time will not look like it does now. And it certainly won't look like it did 10 years ago. But, you know, if we're at a fork in the road and you know, I think we should be engaging with this carefully and um, with great enthusiasm, but we need to make sure we're heading down the right fork, not the other. So I don't, again, you know, I don't have a roadmap to make sure we take the right turn, just to be really cognizant of the choices we are making rather than the wholesale ado um, adoption without that uh, critical lens. Sure. Uh, I was just wondering, as an educator, you, make, um, you must make a lot of assessments that are based around critical thinking. And now that you know that students can just use generative AI to replicate critical thinking. Um, do you feel like using Gen AI might have a long-term impact on how people can critically think, especially students who are going to graduate and go into the workforce and where they actually have to critical think and, critically think and they can't just use AI for everything. So do you feel like uh, it might negatively impact their ability, ability to critically think? 
Uh, so this is the fork in the road question again. Um, and yes, if we do it badly, we will impair students' ability to think critically about things. I, I think in the future, the critical things like critical thinking, I mean, we can see this, you know, with social media and disinformation, all that sort of thing. Critical thinking is actually more important now than it has been in the past. But, you know, AI doesn't think critically or otherwise. All it does is, is you know, like a large autocorrect and pick the, the next most likely word to create things. So it's not thinking. Um, but I think kind of behind your question, there's the assumption that, uh, or that, that, you know, we use AI to produce outputs. But what about a, you know, an AI model where a student who is, you know, learning in, in business or something and wants to do a role play and can go and do a role play with an AI and the AI will um, give far more individual attention to the role play and far more opportunity for feedback and compose kind of Socratic questions to, to ensure that students are reflecting and thinking critically about the interaction that they've just had. You know, that's a type of individualized education intentionally honing on those critical thinking skills that we would never be able to do on a kind of traditional lecture tutorial basis. So if we say, you know, here's a reflective essay, you could use AI to write it, or we could say, here is a tool that will help you practice these skills, go and do that and then come back and tell me what you've done in some way, then, you know, that way will lead us to better critical thinking. And it's a very different way of using AI than the first. I think the question at the back was up first. Sorry. Hi, thanks very much for your talk. My name's Bill Ashraf, uh, University of Sydney, but only week one. Um, <laughs> well, welcome. I, uh, thank you. I was, I was very interested in your comments around decolonization of the curriculum. I'm thinking about um, best practice and models. I've just come from uh, New Zealand or Toroa, and there are very sort of specific sort of, um, I guess, requirements on universities in terms of the Treaty of Watangi. So I'm just wondering, in, in terms of, of of that indigenization of curriculum, in my case, it was on Maori, and uh, what, what was called uh, um, the very sort of processes of, of the way Maori thinking and learning. Do you think there are any sort of models out there that we could actually look at in terms of successful ways forward rather than reinventing the wheel? Yeah, look, there's absolutely, these, these are wheels that have been made. Uh, maybe not completely made, but there are definitely models out there that we can think about. Um, I do think that New Zealand does have a lot we can we can learn from. Uh, obviously, Australia is a different context. Australian universities are different to New Zealand universities, but just the the ways of approach are really important. There's a lot of First Nations Canadian work around this as well. Um, so yes, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be starting from scratch, but nor should we be shying away from taking these models and adapting them to the local conditions and our own First Nation cultures. We had some questions at the front. There's one over the back there afterwards as well. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for your presentation. My name's Lauren Ribbon. I'm Student Life Coordinator here at the University of Sydney. I just had some questions about the graph where you had um, consultation, collaboration, co-design, leaning towards more agency. Can you give us an example of what might be considered collaboration and what might be considered co-design and how that leads to greater agency? Sure. So the difference that I'm trying to make here is... Um, in my kind of, the things that I am calling collaboration are still things where there is a power difference between, um, you know, there's an us and them between staff and students. So the example I used was about student participations on committees, because um, I actually think there's a talk coming up later on, on this topic. So I, I encourage you to go to that if you're interested. Um, but it's the, the way that students are, um, the way that students are incorporated in committees is not as full members or the way that uh, academic policy talks about students not like they are like everyone else who's going to be on that committee. So there's that strong power difference. So the, the thing that is different in my mind between that and a partnership model like co-design is that co-design is very intentionally set up to minimise those power differences as much as possible. But it is a spectrum. So if you're, you know, there are 
things that we would call co-design projects that are probably angling more towards that collaborative model. And there might even be, you know, examples that uh, of academic governance and so on that are actually angling more towards the, the partnership model. So don't focus too much on the terms, but that's the difference between those categories as, as I'm characterizing it. Hi, Ryan. Um, I'm Kale from UTS. This has been very informative. Thanks so much for the talk. Uh, I had a question. You've spoken about it a little bit, um, and I was wondering if you could expand upon um, the, you know, we we talk about student success and we talk about students, and we often see students as a monolith and a yeah. monoculture. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about you know, diversities of students and how we can approach ideas of success when students themselves or neither our staff, mm. um, you know, the same identity and have the same outlooks on things. Mm. Yes, where students themselves don't agree on what success means. Right. Um, look, I mean, the reason it was a provocation is because I don't have a simple answer. <laughs> um, so there is the... I think if if I have an answer, it's about creating space to acknowledge the the differences and to allow people to find those answers. Um, but as as I said, there are in the work that I've done, there are these twelve kind of meta categories of the way students think about success. You know, there's not infinite variation here. So it's not like we're designing in a complete void. You know, we know that things like learning, personal growth, future opportunities are important in the way that students in general think about success. Now, maybe for me as a student, I'm all in on job opportunities. That's the only thing I care about. Um, and, you know, there's this kind of individual variation in how I characterize that. But if we start by knowing that there are these, these 12 big things that we should be thinking about, that students are thinking about, and we can create space around that for students to work out this is a plus for me, whereas this is irrelevant to me. Um, and so because I, I value this, this is success for me, the university will help me achieve that by going to this and doing this and participating in these ways. Whereas if I was more interested in these activities, then the university will find me a way to participate in them. So I think it's about us being aware of the broad categories that students might want to participate in and consider success, um, but then creating space within that for students to actually kind of, you know, find their own truths and participate in ways that will lead them to be successful or not, um, but have the opportunity to, to work out what it means for them. So it's creating the system. I mean, as I said, social psychology, it's very social psychology answer. Create the system and allow flexibility within it for individual voice and action. Thank you, Ryan. It's um, it's great. I can't tell you how wonderful it is to be here. Um, my name is um, Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Koto Kato, called Sally Varnum um, from Aotearoa, New Zealand. And um, ex- University of Technology, Sydney. It's it's amazing to see everybody and listen to everybody talking. One of the things that I have going through my head all the time at these at, at situations like this is when you talk about success and empowerment and trust and respect. And I can never quite decide whether it goes without saying because it underpins everything, is the development, assisting in the development of democratic citizens, of citizens for democratic societies. Hmm. Um, and I, uh, one of the things I could say when you get to my age is you think our society, our democracy is so messed up. And is that, is that because we're not working on development of citizens? My research started as practicing citizenship in schools. And, and I went on from there into um, student voice. And the thing that is, always, one of the big things that has always driven me, all the things that we've talked about are so uh, absolutely valid and useful and everything. But one of the things that has always driven me is what is the purpose of higher education or of tertiary education or of any education? And to me, its success is for students, for their moving forward in society. But underpinning all of that has to be society, the development of 
democratic citizens, citizens who are able to um, find information, read information, assimilate information, and make reasoned decisions. Hmm. And I think that, um, you have to excuse me, because maybe it does go without saying, <laughs> but I thought I'd say it anyway. <laughs> I've been holding, I've been keeping my hand down because as you, anyone who knows me will know that I, once I start talking in this area, I can't stop. But um, I, it's just so great to be here and thank you, Ryan. But I just thought that that was, um, yeah. And also to see all of you people here and how it has become so embedded, just a little anecdote from the beginning. When I was doing citizenship research and citizenship in schools, practicing citizenship, people would come up to me and say, come and see what we're doing at my school you know, we've got student council, student parliaments, all these things that we're doing, we engage students. And then when I got finally, as you would know, waded through and got ethics approval and funding and all this stuff to do the research, um, I'd ring up the schools and say, you know, can I come and see what you're doing? And they'd say, oh, we don't do that anymore. That person left mm. who was really, and this is, that's the big thing that has always worried me mm. right from the beginning that we have to move on for relying on champions in this area. And I think looking around and hearing you and the interaction I have is that we have moved on. And I don't know whether I'm wrongly congratulating um, the, where we've come, but I think we have a long way to go too. But I think that that's fantastic. And it's thanks to all of you, Ali, Anna, Kate, um, everybody who were involved in the beginning and have moved forward with it. But thanks. So thank you all. And thank you, Ryan. No, thank you. For your talk. Look, I did actually have a couple of slides about the risk of champions um, and that we need to move beyond that, but I took them out for time because partly thought, like you said, it maybe goes without saying. But I think it, it since you bring it up, it is really important that we get to um, a point where these this work no longer relies on the work of champions and it's just part of daily business. On the topic of the purpose of education, um, I, I do agree with you but I don't think 100% of society does. So if you think about the tradition of liberal arts and liberal education, um, you know, within the American model, for example, there's that two years of general education and civics is, at least until quite recently, was always part of that. So definitely there is that, um, that heritage of civics education being part of what higher education was. In the US. That was never the case in Australia. Um, and I would speculate that if you went out on the street and said, what's university for? People would say qualifications for getting jobs. And that's a very different understanding of the purpose of higher education than the sorts of principles that you're talking about. But, you know, the the meaning and purpose of higher education is up for grabs. You know, it's not, it's not set in stone. It's not inevitable that this is the Australian understanding of higher education. That's where this, this theme of agents of transformation comes in. And, it, you know, if that is the view of, you know, of, of we in this room, the university, that's the thing, then this is something that we can challenge and fight for, that we can talk about and that we should talk about the purpose of, uh, universities in creating civically minded societies, not job opportunities and economies. But it is, I think, a bit of a struggle perhaps in the way that universities are currently understood right now. Um, but I don't want to end on an overly cynical note. Um, I think that's a wrap in terms of questions for time. I'm so sorry we couldn't get to everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, this was a fantastic keynote and fantastic uh, time to actually go deeper into answering some questions, some uh, curved questions. So well done on answering all of those.